Love what you have. I think we're in a culture that is teaching us to want what we don't have. Build on what you've got if you possibly can. We all want what we don't have, and that's fine. It's motivating. But don't live there. You miss out on what you have. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Kondos. Our early years leave a lasting impact on how the rest of our lives play out. And for adult children of alcoholics, it can leave them with trauma they might not even realize they have. So how does childhood trauma specialist Tion Dayton help people unpack their past and create a better future? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. It's my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Tian Dayton. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so in the last episode, we covered uh, some of your personal story, the journey you took to uh, doing what you do uh, with psychodrama specifically. Uh, and so now uh, we'll dive into your new book, Social, Soulful Journey of Recovery, um, and, and which you're speaking about here at the U.S. Journal Conference mm-hmm. in Arizona. So first of all, tell us kind of why this book. I know you've written 15 books. So, so what, what's, uh, what's special about this one? What, what motivated you to write this book? Uh, well, I love to write. I love to have a writing project. I, lo- I believe in books. I believe books can change your life. Hmm. And I wanted a, uh, you know, people do best of songs. You know what I mean? So this is sort of best of. I wanted to do kind of a best of book because every book I've written has really been something I've wanted to explore in depth, or not something I have been exploring in depth. Because remember grief, for example, when I wrote uh, about grief, uh, heart wounds, that we didn't talk about grief as non-death related Mm -hmm. when I wrote that book. We we thought grief happened when somebody died. And I thought, no, grief has happened. I've had a lot of death in my life, but people are still alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Just I understand death to relationships. Death yeah, to, so the death yeah. of my family, the death. I mean, it, the family as I knew it, we were mm. still a family. But the death of my sober father, the anyway, loss is really what mm. you'd call it. Uh, but we didn't think it needed grieving in my day, so that was a big deal for me to kind of associate grief with uh, trauma and with uh, life loss. That was uh, a lot at that time. And my books have all gone along that trauma and addiction I wrote, thinking that I need to connect these two things. I mean, Bessel's research had, and I thought this is this is at the base of our field. I need to, I waited for somebody else to write a book about it because I thought I really wasn't the person. And 10 years later, nobody had written it. So I thought, well, okay, I'll write that. And so I write what seems useful. Uh, psychodrama, of course, I, I write about because that's what I do. And this one, I wanted to write something that just talked about everything that I thought was the most valuable along somebody's path of recovery. So this book has each of the categories that I think you encounter on the journey of recovery. And I know that the uh, younger generation likes interactive things, and I'm all about interactive things. So every chapter has uh, exercises so that you can personalize the material and really make it relevant. And it helps you learn it. Yeah, it's exactly. It's a journey book. It's interactive. I've put guided imageries on my website to support the exercises. So I've tried to make it uh, fun. I think recovery, you think should be fun, you know, and it should be cool and it should be kind of juicy and, you know, you can get into it. Then it's neat to heal then. Yeah, yeah. And so the the subheading for this book is talking, talking about, you know, adult children of alcoholics, adverse childhood experiences. And so specifically with the, with the adult children of the alcoholics, if somebody listened to the last episode, they know that that's you, you your story, grow, you know, growing up uh, with a father who had an addiction. Um, you've been in this work for over 35 years now. So could you kind of give us a glimpse as to what the landscape looked like back then? You know, in, in the 70s, uh, 80s, you know, how did people view addiction, especially related to how it affected the family and the children? Well, first of all, nobody thought it did affect the family. Mm. They thought, uh, we just need to get the alcoholic sober and then everything will be fine. And we did that. We got our dad sober for not a matter of weeks, but not for long. But um, 
we were anything but fine. We were a, a mess. And now we had lost our whipping boy. I mean, we had blamed everything on dad. Hmm. And now he was sober and we ha- we didn't know what to do with our pain. And it turned into hate and it turned into blame and it turned into shame that we couldn't call shame. So that turned into blame. And with all of this uh, unnamed pain was there as he sobered up. And I remember sitting with dad who was drinking a glass of water and saying, this is what my drink from now on and looking around at our family. And even in eighth grade, I I knew he would never be able to stay sober in our family um, because we hated him. It just, it just wasn't an environment that would sustain that or what? We couldn't let him get better. Hmm. He had to stay in his position as the sick guy. And we needed him to because be that's, sick. That's how the family had kind of grown around. That's how that, we coalesced. That idea. We were like this warped, you know, thing that had grown around a, you know, mushroomed, and it was creepy. Hmm. And we needed a fall guy, and Dad had been the fall guy. And when Dad died, we needed new fall guys. And then it was just uh, give in a game of hot potato. Hmm. Yeah. You know, we we can't get it to where. We are interesting people. We're fun. We're smart. We're all that stuff. But we can't quite get past this thing. Hmm. Yeah. And so you you say, you know, at the time, you know, a few decades ago, people didn't even think it affected the family to, to have an addiction around. How has that changed? How have you, how have you seen that develop, like, in, in our society? Family view? programs. Hmm. That part of getting an addict sober is inviting the family in. And hopefully good programs getting the family to own uh, where they are. It's not like everybody's got to own their part. That's a sort of a blaming position. I think everybody has to understand how hurt they've been and how uh, disillusioned they've been and how disappointed in the system and what the secondary gains are for each of them of having some guy act out all the problems on their behalf. Because remember, systems pop alcoholics out. Mm. So the alcoholics don't come out of nowhere. Mm. And in this day and age when there's so much available drugs, but some people don't choose to use drugs to self-medicate, you know. So there, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered to figure out why somebody uh, became an addict in that system and what's the, what's the system's responsibility. And you're talking about like the family system? Yeah, the family yeah. system. Uh, family systems produce uh, scapegoats and alcohol can be a manifestation of a family disease. So people need to get square with themselves. Otherwise, they just continue to live out the family disease. And and so the other, you know, term from this book subheading is the adverse childhood experiences. Could could you unpack what that is and maybe how it's distinct within the broader spectrum of, of trauma? Well, they nailed it on with the research. Kaiser Permanente had a fellow called Vincent Folletti who was doing a... Um, a clinic for people with for obesity, right? He was very successful. He got everybody losing weight. They were making lifestyle changes, so forth. But then at a certain point, they all kept dropping out of the program. And being a researcher, he didn't say they were doing something wrong. He said, why are they dropping out of the program? Let me, let me understand more. So he interviewed them all, and he found out practically in most cases uh, that they'd been sexually abused. That, that the food was uh, medicating hmm. that kind of pain and that losing the weight so relatively quickly made people feel exposed. Hmm. And uh, I understand this because I was raped actually when I was 19 and I gained oh, wow. 20 pounds in four weeks. And I remember looking at the mirror and saying, okay, good, I don't look as attractive now. Huh. So that was your that was your body's response to that. That was your mind's response. It was something's response. Hmm. I just I just was self medicating with enough food to gain that much weight, and and I'd been somebody who was very careful. I mean, I I, I didn't have I had good eating habits, mm-hmm. and uh, still do. But at that moment, that was my response because it's so terrifying to be raped. It's so terrifying to be uh, sec- you know sexually abused. It it completely takes over. You can't say no. It it completely takes you're out of control. 
or you you're, are, you're not in control. Somebody is overpowering yeah. you and you're, you are either going to get killed or you are going to get raped. I mean, that's sort of what it boils down to. And the sexual abuse has other, you know, you're being overpowered by a family member who's got you in their thrall. I mean, who you need to survive, right? So your ability to say no and to be in charge of your body is taken away from you. Once that happens, you're, it's an open season uh, for yourself and your self-image and your, um, in the way you're seen, even maybe I don't know, but it, it all, Wait, the all way I you know see is yourself? the way you see yourself. Hmm. Uh, so I know, having had that experience, I recognized Folletti's study right away, and then he uh, he un- he came to understand that this food was covering up something. It wasn't just self medication; it, it was also protection. Right? Rob Anda from the CDC Center for Disease Control recognized that this was a a potentially big study. Now, Kaiser Permanente was funding the study simply to figure out why people came to the doctor more often. Hmm. They weren't looking for anything specific. They were just asking the question, what contributes to more doctor visits? Because they wanted to figure out how to reduce it. Hmm. What popped up over and over and over again in their research was... A parental addiction. They weren't looking for it. Hmm. It just was one of the determining factors in adverse childhood experiences because once you have an addicted parent, you're more likely to have a physically abusive parent, an emotionally abusive parent, a sexually abusive parent. Because the governors are down for the addict, their acting out behaviors go up. Hmm. And so ACEs tend to cluster You don't have like one adverse childhood experience. You tend to have a cluster. It's very seldom that you live with addiction and there aren't any other clustering abuses. So people with high what they call ACE scores are more at risk for physical health problems later in life. Now, remember, connecting the mind and the body is a big deal in our current culture. Mm -hmm. In in my day, if you said... um, Oh, you mean my emotional issues, you know, lead to physical problems? That's nonsense. Mm. And you'd get kind of a little look of, you know, silly thought. You, mm. Why would you say something like that? Now people, through these researches, are um, understanding that what happens to you emotionally affects your body and your your likelihood and your immune system and all of it. Huh. And so the, the adverse childhood experience or, or the ACE study, uh, that kind of drew the correlations that that kind of tied everything together yep. as far as that? Yeah. What experiences in childhood lead to more doctor's visits? Hmm. Living with addiction, living with sexual abuse, being sexually abused, being physically abused, being emotionally abused, having um, uh, in- incarcerated parents, uh, poverty, all, all of the factors that contribute. Yeah, yeah. And so then another kind of factor when you're talking about somebody who grows up in this type of environment is their attachment. Yes. So so could you talk about kind of how that plays into this, why healthy attachment is important and and what can go wrong when it's not there? Well, attachment is fundamental to everything. A baby's attached to their parents and parents should be attaching to their babies uh, naturally. You don't, you don't survive without attachment. There was a, um, well, there, there was in the 1400s there was a spanish king who did an experiment he wanted to see uh, what language children would speak if nobody taught them so he raised them without parents right they were fed they they ran around and they uh but they weren't taken care of they weren't talked to played with and they all died so they were being fed food but they all died because they didn't have that connection. They had no attachment. They had no people loving them, holding them, touching them, caring about them, tuning into them, being mindful of what their feelings were, of of creating feedback loops, of interacting with them. So nothing grew neurologically, right? And their bodies just caved in. Mm-hmm. So we need love and attachment as much more than food. We need to feel 
a sense of connection with primary people. That's those are the early attachments. And if you're a therapist, you know you get sort of tired of tracing things back to the early attachments all the time. But in fact, if you don't, you miss the you miss the healing. Because, uh, for example, in an alcoholic family, an addicted family system, the constant object, the children need consistency and regularity to, it, to know what to expect, to attach without anxiety. But if they have a caregiver that is inconsistent, they attach with anxiety. Mm. They, they learn what, what love feels they, like. They learn to expect anxiety and un- instability. They they learn they feel unstable mm. unstable because the because the person they love isn't there in a consistent basis. They don't expect instability. Children always, I think, at some level, expect to be able to attach. Mm. They're like little natural things that expect to be able to attach. If you're not there to attach, they then there there's not that f- constant feedback loop. Or if your attachment is, uh, you know sick they learn a sick attachment mm. yeah. and so you you've talked about some of the research and the studies over the years that have caused big steps forward breakthroughs uh, in this type of work uh, what does some of the modern neuroscience what what, what are the latest uh, scientific medical breakthroughs t- tell us about this about ACs about uh, attachment about about ACOAs well the big thing with neuroscience is it brings the body into the picture I mean, what psychodrama, when I started in psychodrama, I had to explain it to everyone. Nobody understood why talk wasn't enough. Why can't you just talk these things over? Once you understand it, why isn't it better? Hmm. Well, once you understand it, it isn't necessarily better. Your body has to experience feelings. We process our emotions in our limbic system. We Not in our heads. If people try to think their feelings, they, they're not very well integrated bonding. You know, that, that doesn't mean you, how do you fall in love through your head? How do you uh, carry a baby through your head? How do you have sex through your head? You have that through your body, through the emotions in your body that are integrated with thought. If you split the mind and the body and make them two different entities, it's a depressing way to live. It's a dissociated way to live. So neuroscience is saying, wait, the mind and body are connected. They are interrelated systems. And they are constantly interrelated, which is why I can look at this cup and pick it up. My brain is telling me to pick it up. If it weren't a constantly integrated system, I, how would I, I would just think the thought of picking it up and my, I would think my hand is sitting there, but I wouldn't, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have children, if you hold them, if you take care of them, they are all over you. Little healthy children want to be on top of you. They want to pull at you. They want to pull your face. They, they want to touch you. They want to feel you near. Mm. And there's another uh, at um, Bellevue, there was a study of, of babies that were constantly getting sick, right? Mm. So the nurses were instructed not to touch them because you shouldn't touch them. You might get sick. A doctor took over this ward and took all those signs down and put up signs saying, pick up the children, cuddle the children. Their, their immunity... Now, they didn't get on a special antibiotic. It was just from the contact. From the physical contact, love and care and cuddling. And it affected their immunity physically. Yes. It tells your body to say, yes, Mm. I'm healthy, I'm alive, I'm part of this. It's worth being here. Somebody values me. Yeah. Yeah. And so here at the conference, uh, U.S. Journal Training, you're speaking with people who are working on the front lines, doing this work, mm. you know, therapists, uh, people who are working at recovery centers. What, what's your message for them? What, what, what do you hope they take home to their lives and their work? Do this simply and do it daily. Hmm. Live the right way. I try to think the right thought all the time. Live the right thought. Uh, have s- simple pleasures. My grandmother used to say, I'm easy to please. She'd say, honey, I'm easy to please. That's why we all adored my grandmother. Uh, I said, Grammy, what's your secret? She said, honey, I'm easy to please. Be easy to please. Be uh, uh, spiritually alive. Be appreciative of life. Uh, not daily. 
all through the day. Be appreciative of life. Be appreciative. Love what you have. Loving what you don't have just brings more of what you don't have. Love what you have. It expands in your gaze. It's like watering the universe. The universe is alive. Water it with appreciation and love because then it will keep growing. If you, if you keep seeing it as a deficit, it will keep creating itself as a deficit. Mm. It's like a big Petri dish. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, we've, we've mentioned some of your books, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, what, what would be one other you know, book, resource, something that you'd recommend for somebody listening who wants to dive in even deeper? The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I ran into Bessel's work uh, in the mid '80s, uh, I f- I felt I was stunned. It was it explained everything. I went from being a diagnostician to thinking trauma, no trauma, to just understanding trauma. It made my work so much easier, and I set about integrating psychodrama with his trauma theory. theory. At that point, so every I have been, that's been my sort of specialty, I would say, is integrating uh, how to use psychodrama in treating trauma because it's a, it's a specialty. It, it, it's a, it requires its own body of knowledge. And uh, so I would say Bessel's work, if you want to understand trauma, start there. Uh, Peter Levine's work. Um, yeah, good places to start. Yeah, there's a lot of good work out there, but that's where I I really have gotten a lot out of that. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, Dr. Dayton, thank you so much for your time again. Uh, just to leave listeners with one last thing, uh, what would be a favorite piece of advice? Uh, so something that uh, has meant a lot to you, that somebody gave you over your journey uh, or something that you find yourself passing on? You know, keep it simple. Love what you have. That I, I guess I said that already, but I think, um, I think we're in a culture that is teaching us to love, to want what we don't have. And we are the losers because if you love what you have, and I'm not saying stay if it's terrible, I'm not saying all of that kind of stuff, but I think love what you have, stick through it, build what, build on what you've got if you possibly can, because you will, uh, I know the joy of being a grandparent with my husband of, who is the father of our children, who loves the grandchildren the way I love the grandchildren. Yeah. It's, it, it's really something. And the, the sense of thread and integration for everybody concerned is uh, very reassuring and very uh, solid. It's all silver threads, but they're solid. Um, so I think love the children you have, love the grandchildren you have. And, it, and we all want what we don't have, and that's fine. It's motivating. But don't live there. That's a That's an... That's too bad. You miss out on what you have. There it is. You miss out on what you have. Dr. Tian Dayton is a former New York University professor of psychodrama who now serves as a senior fellow with the Meadows based in New York. Learn more about her work at tiondayton.com. Beyond Theory is produced and hosted by me, David Condos. You can discover more from this podcast, including videos of each conversation, at beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening this season, and I hope you'll join us again next time for Season 4 of Beyond Theory. Beyond Theory.